Hi there, everybody. Welcome to week 11 of ABCD ReproNim. We are really excited for today's discussion. Uh, a couple of quick reminders before we move into things. We want to remind everybody to go ahead and please submit your project proposals. We want you to continue uh, listening to the lectures and use the content that we're providing in them to think really hard about what kind of project you want to work on for project week. The deadline to submit your project proposals is now going to be February 19th, so a week from today. You've really submitted some amazing projects so far. So we invite everybody to take a look at the GitHub Issues tab on our projects page. And let me go ahead and paste that into the live chat for everybody who hasn't already taken a look at that. Um, we're currently working on an FAQ stock, frequently asked questions. We know everybody is sort of wants a better sense of what project uh, week is going to look like. So we're going to be distributing some information to give you a, a little bit of a guidance about that. If you don't plan to submit your own project purport, proposal, then we really want to encourage you to take a look at the existing proposals and see if there's one that, that you'd like to contribute to that week. If you do plan to join us for project week and you haven't provided confirmation to us that you have access to the ABCD data set, please, please, please go ahead into Canvas to complete the ABCD data access confirmation. It's located under assignments. And this is the assignment where you actually upload a screenshot of your data access permissions from ENDA. And that allows us to add you to the final list of students that are eligible for Project Week. So with that, I will hand it over to Dave. Hi, everyone. Welcome to week 11. My uh, honor today is to introduce our speakers. Uh, we first have Katie Bottenhorn. Uh, say hello and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Katie Bottenhorn. I am a graduate student at Florida International University, um, where I am currently wrapping up that dissertation. Um, and yeah, doing some really fun stuff with uh, individual variability within and between human beings. Great, looking forward to that final uh, document. Uh, and also we have uh, Juliana Bates. Hi everybody, I am Julie Bates. I am a neuroscientist by training. So I came into imaging after already doing probably 10 years of wet lab work in uh, neuroanatomy and um, behavioral studies in non-human primates. So I kind of predate a lot of the imaging tools that now are really readily available. And I came to them because they allowed looking at the whole brain in a lot of different ways. So I actually did a postdoc with Dr. Kennedy and I actually now I'm working with the RIPNIM group in the admin core and as part of the training group. Great, thank you, welcome aboard. And uh, hopefully you've seen the lectures, but they're on uh, Katie with visualizing ABC data and uh, Julie with reproducible workflows and analysis via the repro prob. Today's uh, leader for our presentation uh, is Lisa. I know you've been with us before, but say hello again and remind people. Sure. About you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Dave. Yeah, my name is Lisa Levitas, and I'm currently a graduate student in my first year uh, between the National Institute of Mental Health and University College London. Great. So I think uh, the rest of the introductions come from Jessica. Yeah, I just have a few course related announcements. Um, uh, like Angie mentioned, we've been getting a few questions emailed to us about um, Project Week and how it will go. So like Angie said, we're working on putting together a little Project Week FAQ and um, you can expect that in one of the next emails that's gonna go out to you guys. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to keep reaching out to us with your questions. We'd love to see how many project proposals are coming in. Um, that's one of the reasons why we extended the deadline a little bit to submit those project proposals, um, because uh, we think that we think that there's a lot of really cool stuff coming on. We want to we make sure to give you the opportunity to um, submit that before Project Week happens. Um, about those project proposals, we're also going to be um, reaching out to you guys um, that have submitted uh, ideas for Project Week in just a little bit. Um, not next week, but the week after next on February 26th, we're going to um, dedicate this Q&A session to go over basically what to expect for project week, how to prepare, um, all that kind of stuff. And part of that, we'd love to have some little mini project pitches from you guys to kind of um, uh, get people to join your group and to join your project and to collaborate in that way. So we'll be reaching out to you with that. If you are an observer student um, and want to participate in project week, um, make sure to complete um, uh, some of the quizzes uh, for each week because we have sent out invitations to 
uh, observer students who have been actively participating in the course and we've defined that as completing six or more of those uh, data exercises. Um, and we've sent out invitations to enroll for Project Week to observer students who have completed those six plus um, uh, data exercises. If you didn't get an email from us, but you do want to submit um, a project proposal or participate in Project Week, make sure to complete those quizzes so that we can then get your email on our list and then I'll send out a new round of invitations. Um, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to just briefly mention, um, we're going to put together a little uh, Gather Town social hour. Uh, that'll be a, a bit of a, a weekly thing. And I know that we really have two weeks left in the class before project week. So uh, maybe it'll just be two sessions, but um, I think it'll be a fun little place to just say hi and hang out. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with Gather Town, but it has made some cool uh, advances over the past little bit. There's now ping pong in Gather Town. Anyways, um, I, I'm gonna send out an email with some more details about that um, and when it'll be. But um, yeah, expect some Gather Town social hours. So come join us for that. Uh, and that's the end of my announcement. So let's get started with some of the questions that you guys submitted for this week. Yeah, so um, we'll, we're going to start with a referendum question. So the first one is, is there a standard format for sharing results of a research object? Um, for example, should we share unthresholded results as well as as well as thresholded and where should we share it? Hmm. Well, the threshold part of that question, I'm going to defer to uh, the folks who know much more about that than I do. I, I, I can't really respond to that. In terms of, actually, let me look at the question. I know you've just said it, but you actually have multiple components in there. So in terms of the standard format for sharing research objects, there are actually quite a few different research objects. So I think even though I can't give a uniform answer to that, I would say that because um, there are a lot of different kinds of research objects, right? So there can be a workflow, there can be a data set, there can be something else. So in terms of format from that point of view, the contents are a little different. Um, there is, there's one thing I will point you to, and then I'm also gonna let the Reprenum folks actually give a little more informed answer about some aspects of that. But I will say that the, um, the research objects uh, Symposium in which I have a link for that, the workshop on workshop on research objects, which actually addresses a lot of different types of research objects and work that people are doing to develop them, which actually deals not only with the research objects that I may have mentioned in my lecture or that someone else may have mentioned in this course, but additional things like research objects being developed in the citation side and things such as bids format that can be conceptually considered research object, there are a lot of different things involved in that. So I would actually point everybody to that if you're interested specifically in research objects and all the different ways that people are thinking about them, because I think there's a construct of a research object of things that are being bundled up together. But there are different ways I think that one can do that. So that's my general answer to that. But I will also put that out for Reprenum folks who actually can say more on the tech side for it. Sure, thank you. The first bit of tech side, I'll add to that, and I see JB also may want to, uh, Jay McGilby uh, may also want to get into uh, part of the answer, but uh, from the thresholded versus not threshold point of view, uh, one of the purposes of putting the results out there is so that you can verify that you have re, you know, run, you know, the prior workflow. So in that case, you know, giving the complete results, you know, is really part of, of the point there, so that uh, then other you know, interpretations of the thresholding other you know it's more amenable to other meta analyses and things like that so again the push to get the raw results the complete results out there is partly for verification so we'd like that to be complete and partly for supporting future meta analyses and things like that and again julie also got to the point that all the different research objects are each of them are kind of different each of them wants to use as much standard as possible and where you put them really depends on what the object is if the object is code it could well be in a github if the object is data it could be at you know open neuro or you know nitric or various places you know and if there isn't an appropriate place zenodo is always kind of a good fallback place where you can get it you know out there registered with the doi uh, and accessible to others jb or satra want to add any additions to that um I mean, I, I, I was just going to say very, I mean, what, what you said basically that the uh, threshold versus unthreshold, it's an easy answer. Always unthresholded plus information of what would, would be the threshold. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's kind of like, uh, and, and then the question is how do you represent that information 
and maybe you know like uh, adopting bids like uh, things you could say hey this is a derivative this is the uh, uh, image and this is the JSON side card file you know you know stating what is the threshold um, and then if there is actually much more complex things then then maybe I refer to Satra saying explaining you know how do you expressed provenance in the, you know, uh, for, for a, a spe uh, I mean, like a thresholding is one process, right? You could have much more complex things uh, happening. So, uh, so yes, the, uh, the capacity to go back and, and recreate, you know, your derivative is, is the thing that we, we, uh, we're looking for uh, uh, at the same time, if it's uh, to uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, sometimes you have to make some choices, right? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and just like, Trying to think of what is the common, the common thing that people can redo and or we we, we want to redo is the uh, is the appropriate uptick on this on this aspect. So I'm just going to quickly add that for at least for the ABCD context, a lot of research objects could be neuroimaging output, and NeuroVault is a perfect place to kind of consider storing those things, and it provides a lot of avenues for metadata and provenance to be included uh, and that would allow others to reuse that. So that's specifically to neuroimaging, but as Julie said earlier, the plenty of different kinds of research objects are kind of thinking about each one would probably be a good thing. Thank you everyone. Um, so kind of related to this, I'll pose another referendum related question. So this one is, can we still be fully reproducible if we can't share our data? There are often many examples. For example, we can't share ABCD data. Yeah, that's a big question. I actually, I am going to punt that one to the powers that be actually, because I think, I, I will say actually, I do think that this is a graded, this and some of the other questions have a grade, gradation of responses that are legitimate in the sense that because this is actually something that people are trying to get started as a process, that you can't actually start at the end so, and if you, if you try to, and then it doesn't work, it's not necessarily the right conclusion to say it doesn't work or we shouldn't try it. That's actually not really an answer to your question. I just put it out there because as one who actually from the very beginning of graduate school always chose to do the hardest possible thing, <laughs> you know, and it was always a choice. Well, are you gonna try it or are you not gonna try it? And, and you know, sometimes you try it and you don't get it all what you're looking for, but you get something else. So I, I'm, I kind of put that out there just because I do think that some of the questions do pertain to that, the, the fact that we're actually really trying to get a process going. But I, I, that's, I realize not a satisfactory answer to your question. So I'm gonna put that out to folks who can answer that better, I think. <laughs> and I'll start with a little nuance and we'll see whatever answers we get added to. To some extent, I would start with the argument that there is always someone who can ethically and appropriately get access to your data. And ABCD, I think is a good example. It's not easy, you can't share it you know, openly with everyone, but you can, and in fact, as part of your DUC are required you know, to some extent to put that back into the shared uh, resources of, of the NDA you know, uh, uh, collections you know, me mechanism. So again, that's a perfect example of, you, know, you do your ABCD study, you publish you know, that you know, you know, result or that subset of subjects into the NDA collection, and then NDA worries about the authorization. There are people who are authorized to see that. And so fine, they can get to it. And if people want you know, to become authorized to get access to that, well, then they know the pathway to doing that. So it's very rare that no one can you know, see your, your data. It may not be completely open, but there's probably some ethical way for someone other than the acquirer to see that. And that's what we just gotta one, make sure people are trying to, to take advantage of and making that as available as ethically possible given the constraints you know, of that data and to include that with the publication so that someone you know, could, could uh, do that you know, sort of verification part of, of that process. Yeah, I will say also actually that when I worked in, in I mean primates actually, and we were never allowed to share our data. So data sharing has been an issue for a long time if you work with rare subject data of any sort. Um, so when I was in graduate school, we were held to a very high standard of your methods must be reproducibility, must be reproducible, even though your data cannot be shared in its form. And you have one, you know, basically might study one, one animal's data, one brain set for a lot of different questions, and you couldn't send your data out somewhere. Someone might come and visit the lab and look at it, but we were actually not allowed to 
sit for our masters. We weren't allowed to sit for our dissertation proposal unless somebody else who was not us and wasn't our lab, you know, RA folks who could actually reproduce the methods as we wrote them. So there were different ways that reproducibility would come in. You, you make reproducible what you can. That's, that's extremely helpful to hear. And um, I don't think that this is a standard that is in place in a lot of <laughs> disciplines. No, I, I think it's not, it's not, it wasn't even then I would say. And in fact, I, when I was a postdoc, someone came up to me and said, boy, you are old school, aren't you? And he said, and I know why you are because I know who you trained with. But we were really held to that. And we were actually held to it partly too, because I think if you, if you, you know, it's actually like small, small end studies. If you have a small sample, then, you know, how, how else are you going to be able to clarify what it is you've done? Someone needs to at least understand very well what you have done and then be able to think about that in a larger context. So yeah, that was considered very important. And, and also it was, okay, your results, your results, the data that you get from using that process are your results and, and people infer a lot, but if you're inferring a lot from, you know, an N of one, even if you have thousands of cells that you've charted, it's still an N of one as a subject. So, you know, that's, that was something that was considered, you must be able to show how you have, you, it's basically, it's data veracity. It's, you know, to the best of anyone's ability, what you have done is, is the best you can do with that. And we go from there. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm gonna move on to Katie. So here's a more simple ABCD question first or data visualization question first. So the question is, um, this tutorial is super helpful. Thank you. It's nice how there are plotting methods that do multiple lines of code in one function like Seaborn's rec plot or LM plot. I've been using Seaborn to plot things for a while but I didn't know about any of these. This will save me a few lines of code. How do you learn about these kinds of functions or methods within libraries in Python? Do you just have to read the docs? So reading the docs is a great way to learn how to use things, but it can get a little hairy if you're just like browsing through docs to try to find um, new things to do. But that is why the galleries are a great place to start because you can start by looking at a finished product and get ideas for like different ways that you can visualize data and different ways that you can like make use of some of the really neat features that are built into a lot of these libraries. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and post in the chat, the gallery, like Seaborn's gallery. Um, this is where many of my fun data viz adventures have started. Um, and I kind of work backwards from the way the question was phrased. I start here and look at all the possible pretty things I could make. Um, and then once I kind of get a handle for like, what are the options and what are the possibilities, I dig into the docs after that to like really uh, customize things. Yeah, and I would say that, I mean, my approach has been basically the same. I mean, it's always much more helpful, I think, to just like find examples of somebody doing exactly sort of what you're trying to do. And I mean, oftentimes just by looking at the code somebody else had made, you learn how to simplify things and make, make it so much more efficient along the way. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, let's see. Um, I'll quickly go back actually to Repronym. So I think this is a really good question, a very important one. So for old projects, what are the possible steps to create research objects for already published results? Oh, Julie, you're muted. Ah, okay, sorry. I actually, let me think about that for a second. Can you just repeat the question? Cause that yep. one. So for old projects, mm -hmm. what are the possible steps to create research objects for results that have already been published? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to hand that question off, actually, because I'm not sure I can actually. I, I, yeah, I'm going to pass that question to folks, sure. you know, <laughs> how to answer that properly. If I just may say, like, it seems that it's a uh, it's, uh, it, it's going to be often very manual. Uh, so it's going to be like a, a little bit of a, uh, a post-mortem or <laughs> uh, analysis of some kind of, you just have to say, okay, where, where are those data? Where, where, is, where is the code? Can I contact the people that have, so often going to be, I'm going to have to contact you know, the, uh, the authors, the authors, most of them are not going to respond. Some of them might have response and give you some other contacts. And like, so it's going to be a very manual process. Uh, and I think that's 
let's say you've done this process once or twice, this is why it gives you the motivation to make sure that this uh, has not have to be done in the future. Uh, I think uh, that's, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't see a general kind of like, you know, uh, methodology rather than, uh, you know, so far like a email contact. Uh, uh, I mean, sometimes you may, you may kind of appeal to university or institutions when uh, authors are not responding, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, journals won't, won't help you very much in that, in that respect. They, uh, they will defer to authors 99% uh, of the case. Um, so yeah, I don't uh, I don't think there is a, there is a satisfactory uh, answer to to that question. But uh, just to let you know, it, it's it's going to be super manual. And yeah. the reader wanting that is one element of it. But the um, the author, even if I go back to an old paper from you know the mid two thousands and I ah it wasn't reproducible, let me fix that. Well, there's nothing I can do about the Sun OS you know machine that I was running at the time and you know the software I was running at the time but I could probably put my hands on the data and making that data available would be a good thing. I might be able to put my hands on you know, the imaging results and that would be a good thing. I might be able to put my hands on the, at the time, Excel file you know, with the derived you know, numbers and you know, making that available retrospectively are ways to patch in some of the elements you know, to that, all of which are potentially useful you know, going forward. And it's not gonna get it all, but any of those elements that you can add just helps everyone you know, going forward. And the, you know, again, the meta-analysis and the you know, co confirmation or refutation of, of the findings are supported that way. And, uh, and, and uh, just a quick addition, I mean, the, the one thing that is always going to get in your way for new imaging data and in, uh, human neuro imaging data, data is the uh, informed consent and ethical aspects uh, for sharing. Like uh, that's, that's the thing that is completely critical to take care you know, uh, early on in a project because reconsenting subjects is extremely hard I and mean, like it's it's like you you won't you won't get all of them and, and so on and so on so uh, so that that aspect is 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 one of the critical roadblocks i think yeah yes yeah, so i think the takeaway is just share as much as you possibly can any of that will ultimately help somebody else who's trying to i guess reproduce whatever results that you did report in your study thank you and try to do things going forward yeah yes um, okay, so back to ABCD. There are a few questions that are actually kind of related, so I'll merge them a bit. Um, and so they mostly just have to do with differences between using like plot.plot .plot or x dot x label or y label. So I'll read one of them right now. Um, this seems like a very simple question, but being someone who is not very advanced at Python, I've been pretty confused for a while now about the fig and x fields in matplotlib. What exactly are they and how are they different? Um, and there are a few other questions that are part of this. So does X refer to the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, or the entire bo bounding box? Um, does fig refer to the area in which you're plotting? Would you ever do something like fig.plot, fig.scatter, or fix.legend instead of x.plot, x.scatter, fig.legend? If you want to plot a 3D plot, how would you specify which axis the term X refers to? Or is this managed by the order of the inputs inside the x.plot method? So I guess perhaps, Katie, if you could just clarify a bit about like the object-oriented nature of matplotlib or Seaborn um, versus the more functional aspect. Thank yeah, you. definitely. That's a really good question um, because that kind of like lays the groundwork for everything you do after. So uh, an easy way to think about it is that the figure is kind of the canvas that you're building on. And the ax object is um, not one of the axes, but like the entire axis object that you put on that figure. So um, it is more like the entire bounding box, but it's um, it's really just like that's where you're going to put your plot. And you can have multiple ax objects on one figure object, um, kind of like you can have multiple panels on like one figure in a journal. Um, and so that like segues pretty nicely into because the fig object is the canvas, it has different methods than the axe object. So um, to answer the one of the sub questions, like I uh, wouldn't do fig.plot or fig.scatter because those methods are for the actual like plot itself, the axis object. Um, but you just like that, you couldn't do like axe.savefig, right? Because savefig is a method of the figure object. So you can save the whole canvas with all of your axis objects and plots um, at once. Um, I actually don't know anything about 3D plots. Um, I know that you can do them. I haven't uh, played around with that yet myself, but as the axe object is like the whole, the whole plot itself, not one or more of the axes in the like uh, Cartesian sense of the word, 
um, then you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about changing the dimensionality there. Um, and also, so the, the quiz for week 11 hasn't been posted yet, but one of the instructions in there is just that we really strongly encourage people to fork the repo that Katie had gone through, clone it to your local computer, or I guess if you're working on the Jupyter Hub, and just go through each of those exercises and like just try to regenerate the plots that Katie had made, mess around with um, the way that some of the plots were generated. And really, I think it's through trial and error that you actually get a sense of like what you can and can't do, like things like x.plot or x.scatter. Yeah, definitely. And I think I saw a related question that I can answer really simply in like a sentence here. Um, somebody else asked about the difference between axe.plot and plt.plot. And that like segues really nicely because just like we're saying, fig is your canvas, axe are the individual plots on that canvas. And the reason you would use axe.plot instead of plt.plot is you can specify exactly where you want that plot to go. So yes, they do the same thing, but you can have a little bit more control when you use axe.plot. Um, and that's really important if you have multiple plots on one uh, figure, because then you can say, like, I want on X2, I want this plot versus X1, I want a different plot. Um, and things can get a little messy if you aren't specific. Um, so that's where it really comes in handy. Thank you. Um, so I'll stick, I'll stick with you, Katie, for now. So I'll ask two questions about Nylearn. There are two kind of related ones. So one of them says, Nylearn is great, but are there any other Python or R libraries out there that we can that we can play with for plotting brain figures? Or is Nylearn plotting the only non-GUI one? Um, brain sprite, question mark, question mark. Yes, uh, there are a lot of options. I am less familiar with, um, with the other things, but I did a quick Google before this, and I have a ho whole host of links. Um, but there are a bunch of plotting libraries in R, and there are some really cool like surface-based um, or surface-oriented um, libraries in Python. Off the top of my head, there's PySurfer and FS, oh yeah, PySurfer and FSBrain in Python and R. Um, and I'll post all the links to these guys um, in that questions document. But um, if you like interactive plots, you can use Brain Sprites. I believe Brain Sprites are built into Nylearn at this point? Yeah, uh, yeah. like Nylearn, Nylearn using Plotly's API to make like the, the 3D plots or like the interactive ones? You can do that too. Um, and that can give you some good like um, visualizations of, I guess the, the surface-based plotting. Um, you can also, I guess through a slightly different method, make kind of, um, what we're used to seeing in our like neuroimaging visualization, like um, what's the word, uh, like software. So you can see like your orthographic three views at a time and zoom through each of them in a linked sort of way um, using brain sprites, which um, would take a bit to um, explain here, but I can probably link to a, an example that'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, oh man. That's not an easy Google. Okay, I will find a link and share it. Thank you so much, Katie. Cool. Um, so I guess now going back to Repronym, so for Julie, um, in your talk, you mentioned a few resources I'm not familiar with, for example, Brainverse and Zenodo. Can you go over some of these things and what they are used for briefly? Yeah, I'm gonna give you a general answer first, which is that um, these two, even these two resources are actually different categories in my mind. There's a set of resources that are tools that are actually tools that enable one or another aspect of reproducibility. There are things that'll make it easier to accomplish some end, um, including Brainverse or Reproman or 3 Um Or there are things like Zenodo. Zenodo is a place, now there may be details about this that I don't know, but I think of Zenodo as a publishing resource in a sense. It's a place where you can actually publish a script, an analysis. Um, so that's actually quite, the implications of that are quite important, but they're very different resources. So some, some are tools to help you get, get your work done, and some are places where you can actually report your work. So um, having repro objects now is something that they can be published in different ways. And that's a whole aspect that I actually, I never got into. And it's, it's, those are components of a repro pub, but they are now becoming publishable units. So that's a significant 
that has significant publication in, in implications for people going forward because now you can actually publish code, you can publish you know, data sets and you, you need to publish data sets now. So that side of things is a set of resources that I think of in the publishing and communication realm. So that's my general answer, but I will put it out for other folks in reprint who are really the tool developers to respond to that more. But basically, you know, there's a whole roster of tools that reprint folks have been creating. They're not, there are things that can help you, you know, manage your data, manage version control, manage, you know, create containers. Perfect, thank you. So I'll let Satra say a little bit more about the brain verse as a particular tool, which again, I'm, uh, but. The other thing about Zenodo is uh, I think of it as sort of as a generalist repository. If you don't have another place to put things, it's a place to put things. Data you have that belongs in Open Neuro or belongs in other places, that's fine. But but if you don't, you know, Zenodo is a place that will that will support that. The other cool thing about Zenodo is you know GitHub doesn't necessarily archive all that well. Uh, so Zenodo is a place where you can you know tag you know a version of your GitHub repo and uh, publish it, so to speak, to Zenodo, get your DOI, get your longevity, get your uh, archival of that so someone can get back to that exact you know, state. Yeah. And Z Zenodo and GitHub interact nicely on, on that uh, axis. Uh, I'll quickly say we have actually paused development on Brainverse for the moment, but the idea behind Brainverse is that it was an electronic notebook to manage projects so that you could link these different pieces as you were doing research. Uh, if anybody who's listening has JavaScript experience, which seems to lack quite a bit in the neuroimaging crowd, uh, feel free to reach out and we can reactivate some of the development there. But we also kind of went back to solve some more fundamental problems. And you've heard some of those in NeuroDocker and Repro Schema and other things that Reprinim has produced. Cool, thank you. Um, and I will say that um, as a little sneak peek of what's to come in the week 11 quiz, one of the exercises uh, we have you actually go through the week nine exercise and you're gonna be pushing that to Zenodo. So people will get more experience with that. Um, so there are two questions that are kind of related that are, that are related to the reprinum content. So the first one is, and this one is obviously a more difficult one to probably answer, which is in your opinion, should reviewers start requesting that submitted papers follow the repro pub standards in their reviews? As a reviewer, I've tried to confirm that the analyses presented in various papers are re-executable, but it's very time consuming. Um, and then the other question that I think ties into this is, I understand that promoting the various elements of a re-executable re re publication as their own linked concepts, but should these objects themselves be peer reviewed before being used, wouldn't that greatly prolong the time needed to publish a paper? Yeah, those are, those are actually both really good questions and they are not easy ones. So um, I'll throw in I think, some. Uh, I think I'm going to let, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of things one can give as an opinion, but I think I'm going to let, I'm going to let some folks respond to that in more depth. So uh, taking that second part first, um, I guess the concept to keep in mind is there is two types of publication. There's you know sort of self-publication, you know sort of a preprint type of you know publication versus a peer-reviewed type of publication. And of course, you can take data and get you know a data publication peer-reviewed, and you can take software and get a software publication you know peer-reviewed. Or you know you can release you know software on GitHub, or you can release data you know in you know Nitric or other places. So I think like with papers and peer review or or you know um, non uh, or preprint. There are sort of preprint options and peer reviewed options for, for all of the different research objects. So I don't think it, so you can, as long as you don't need the peer review of that you know, uh, object, you know, get those out into the preprint servers you know, for the different you know, types of things. Preprint for software might be GitHub, preprint for data might be Nitric, preprint for you know, a Jupyter notebook you know, might be, I don't know, somewhere. Um, but so you can do that in ways I think that get the linked content to the article, but don't necessarily require the peer review over, over a site and are still therefore citable and reusable and you know, sort of trackable, even if they aren't peer reviewed. Now, of course, from your CV point of view, you know, having that peer review, each of those elements peer reviewed would be cool too, but I don't think it has to be a, a, a time binding thing, you know, for, for the overall repro pub. 
right, thank you. I don't know if Sacha or anyone else wanted to add anything. So I think one of the biggest challenges people will face is the scale of data. It's going to be very challenging to reproduce every element of the chain from raw data to the final results. But I think we have to kind of go back to verifying each stage of the chain. And we don't expect peer reviewers to necessarily process 10,000 ABCD brain images to get to the final outcome. It's also going to be computationally super intensive to do that kind of verification. So there has to be a balance between the ability to verify if somebody needs to versus actually verifying some of these things. But the late stages of many of these publications, which are often statistical analysis or other things, are very easy to re-execute. So assuming you've gone to that stage in a reasonable manner, and that's verifiable by somebody if they wanted to do it, it's about making that information available, that last piece could, last piece could easily actually be re-executed or verified. And some of the journals are now partnering with some services like Code Ocean and others uh, to make that process actually happen as part of the review process. Um, I guess my own follow-up question to that then is, um, you had brought up the example of how it would be, it would obviously be very computationally intensive for a reviewer to just completely reprocess a set of ABCD scans or the entire ABCD data set. Would you then encourage people to use tools like fMRI prep, just tools that have, and I think you spoke about this a bit last week or two weeks ago, Satra, that it is better to just not reinvent the wheel. And there has just been such a massive community effort that has gone into creating tools like fMRI prep, QSI prep, various other bids apps that at the very least, we know that there is trust in these tools. And so a reviewer would know that these have been previously peer reviewed. People have obviously QC the outputs of these tools. And so perhaps it's better to just keep using those tools. Absolutely. Uh, just think of it. If I built a car for you, would you ever drive that car? Uh, so I think you want to think about things that have been built by the community. There are two advantages to it. There's a lot of knowledge that has gone into building those. And two, if a bug is found, the community finds that bug and everybody gets notified. Those are two extremely important things in, the, in our way or a journey of getting to more validated workflows and tools. Thank you. Um, actually, there was a question about the ABCD data and bids. So um, are ABCD neuroimaging data already in a bid standard format or, we sh or should we consider putting them into bids before starting our analysis? And so this actually ties into one of the um, upcoming, uh, I guess what we've been calling the over the break homework assignments, where I guess I can answer this one briefly. So there is already the, I think it's like the DCA and labs has already created the bids derivatives, but if any, or I guess like bids formatted data that can be downloaded. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add on to that though. I would, that was the answer I was going to give. Um, the, the actual ABCD release is not bids, but uh, Damien Ferris group has created this cute little uh, manipulator to cast it into the bids format. And again, it's a nice shared NDA collection. You can get that. It has all the metadata necessary and then a cute little downloader that will pull those and organize those in bids for you nicely. Now, if that's all the way up to version three or release three, I don't quite know the status of that, but I presume those kinds of follow-ups will, will come along to keep a bids version of things you know, available going forward. Thank you. Um, back, to, back to you, Katie. So I have two questions. Um, so the first one is, um, it actually disappeared. Let me pull it up one more time. Sorry about that. Um, so this one was, I love using Nylon for plotting brain images. Unfortunately, I can't stand the built-in color maps. Any idea on how we can get some better colors? Yes, I have so many ideas. Um, I really like that question because same. Um, some of them are great, but I love, that's one of my favorite parts of making figures is um, being able to manipulate the colors to make the, the figure say exactly what I wanted to say with my color scheme. Um, so the cool thing is that you can use all the built-ins um, for Nylon, of course, but what you can do if you are looking for other options is you can turn to basically any Python package that can also make color maps. I'm gonna stick with Seaborn for the purposes of this example. And there's actually a really great um, tutorial in Seaborn about like manipulating color maps. And there are some built-ins, more built-ins, always more built-ins. Um, 
and you can basically any color map you can create in Seaborn, you can, or any color palette you can create in Seaborn, you can turn into a color map and then use it um, in your in your nylon plotting just by um, calling it with the CMAP attribute as like the variable that you save this color map as. Um, and it's really handy because you can do things like I, I love the crayons. I love that you can use Crayola color names to build uh, palettes in, in Seaborn. And so what you can do is you can take a color palette that you've made either from um, uh, like a creating a spectrum across colors from the hustle palette or creating your own very favorite rainbow with the crayons. Um, and you can just use the as color map attribute when you're making these color palettes in Seaborn um, to save it as a color map. Um, and there's an important difference between color palettes and color maps. Uh, they seem like they should be interchangeable and somehow they're not. Um, and there are a lot of, um, I guess there's a, a little bit of nuance in the difference, but one way that I find is handy to think about it is color palettes um, are a bit more discrete, whereas color maps are a bit more continuous. Um, and so when you're plotting something like uh, neuroimaging results, where you want a continuous color spectrum that shows you the differences in um, statistical results, then you'd want to use a color map. And when you are using Nylearn to plot basically everything that isn't an ROI or a parcellation, you're going to want to use a color map. Um, and so I posted the link to the Seaborn tutorial on color palettes and color maps. Um, and if you're if you're still confused, fair enough. Um, but you can walk through that tutorial and find a lot more uh, fine grained information about this. Um, and by saving things as color maps, you can just put them right on your nylon plots and make it as colorful or uncolorful as you want. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the next question. Um, this one touches Lisa, on. Could oh. I add just one quick thing to that? Uh, please do consider that there are people who are color blind, and so when you're making the plots try to make sure you can use colors that are kind of universally accessible. That's really and good. that's 100% true. And to follow up, there are some colorblind friendly palettes built into Seaborn that you can use that are straight from um, Color Brewer. And they allow you to do um, both like qualitative and quantitative uh, plotting with colorblind friendly maps. So thanks for reminding me. I meant to add a note about that to my tutorial and it. Um, I think I didn't talk about it, but yeah, very important. Nice. Um, yeah, so I was just beginning to say that um, this next question tackles both the ABCD and the reprenum content. So this one is, um, when creating figures for papers, et cetera, in Python, do you usually build everything within a Jupyter notebook, or is it more common to build it in a non-interactive setting? Relatedly, can Jupyter notebooks be containerized? Katie, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely start with that. Um, so I can speak from personal experience. Um, I'm not really sure what everybody does, but the way that I uh, approach the figure making process is um, when I'm making figures to explore my results or to kind of make sense of my results or to even do like quality control um, when I'm doing data analysis, I like to have plotting functions built into the Python scripts that I run. Um, and I see those more as like plots of utility um, and so it doesn't really matter to me if they're like exactly the right aspect ratio or if they're exactly like the right, um, uh, the right like colors or anything like that. So that can be a very useful tool um, to do some of the, just like to look at your data um, and start making sense of things. I personally do make all of my publication plots using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and I know that Jupyter Notebooks have been criticized for like having reproducibility issues, uh, especially like in the instance that you like run cells out of order um, and do things like that. So they're um, it's definitely one of those things where you have to use your power wisely. Um, you can containerize them. There are a lot of different ways you can include them in um, Singularity or Docker containers with all of the other material you need to make your plots. Um, the tutorials that I shared are in a little binder um, so all of the data and imports and installs are all there. So it's like kind of containerized, um, but there's certainly ways to, to achieve that. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about um, that setup is that you can, um, like when I make figures, I like tweak things, I change the colors a little bit um, and try to make it so that 
I can do it like iteratively and like kind of improve on it until it's like publication ready, right? Um, and that's why I like Jupyter Notebooks, but it is nice to have something that's reproducible when you're done. And so maybe my tweaking doesn't need to be all reflected um, in the final product, but it's nice to be able to, um, to get from like data to figure all in one notebook. Got it, thank you. So that's a, this is a really interesting question. I'm gonna actually do two things. One is I'm gonna give a couple of anecdotes about figures and the provenance behind them. And I'm gonna partly turf this to other reprint folks too to respond to it. So um, one thing just before I forget is that I actually recently heard, I think Marianne may have mentioned this, that, that eLife possibly or some other journal is actually considering requiring going forward in the future that there will, you will need a little packet of information with any figure you submit with your article so that your figure could be regenerated by someone else. And then I will say, this is really interesting to me because going back again to when I actually worked with cell tracing, so pre-imaging um, and, and pre-computational stuff actually, um, if we had anatomical figures and we had photomicrographs that needed to be submitted with an article, um, sometimes the journal would actually request either your actual negatives. Um, they wanted, because this is your data, your cells are your data. So they would want, that's partly for data veracity. And then when Photoshop first came out and you could start to create figures and you could put in your colored cells, you know, that you use three different tracers and you have three different colors in there and you can make, you could actually make beautiful figures. Then they started requiring that you submit with your article submission. So sort of like a research object, they actually wanted the file with the archive function turned on. And if you couldn't provide that, they could reject your paper outright. So I say that because these issues actually are not new ones, but this is our current computational version of them. Now, in terms of the next layer of it, I'll pass it off to reprint and folks in terms of what people are doing right now, because I think Jupyter notebooks are one way somebody, somebody could do things, but I just think it's very interesting to me that, you know, some of these issues go back a ways. Yeah, I think Katie covered, again, there is a containerization, you know, you can work around the notebooks and uh, yeah, so I think Katie covered most of what I was thinking about in terms of that answer. I will just add that for those of you who are following along with the course, all the exercises that execute in the Jupyter Notebook, you'll notice that they're not IPy NB files, they're markdown files. And this allows for version tracking control differences. They may not store the figures that you're generating, but from a reproducibility standpoint and for seeing what the differences are, it's very easy to track what changes have been made. Uh, so Jupyter offers many different formats in which you can store the notebooks and those different formats can be automatically executed. So NB Convert is a tool in the Jupyter ecosystem. So you can generate figures and other things in a reproducible manner uh, using notebooks. Katie mentioned that there were kind of, people have complaints about different aspects of notebooks. There are solutions to those complaints um, and there are ways to work with them. It may not be the perfect kind of Python scripting platform or Python development platform, but in many ways you can make notebooks reproducible. Cool, thank you. Um, so there's one, one more ABCD question uh, for Katie quickly. So a student just want a clarification about one of the, one of the plotting or, uh, the figures that you generated, sorry, in your lecture. Um, so it says, in the lecture, there was a plotting method of y equals x1 plus x2 plus x3 regression. Does this method allow plotting the relationship between y and each of the x's? Also, can we change the regression options such as fixed versus random effects? So I guess just some clarification about um, what statistical analyses like Seaborn itself can actually do versus like which other Python libraries you have to use. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we actually had a, a whole discussion about this in one of our um, one of our um, cognitive neuroscience colloquiums at FIU about like if you have a uh, regression with multiple predictors, how do you display those results in like a responsible and accurate manner, right? Um, because if you're just plotting Y versus X1 and not accounting for X2 or X3 in your plot, then you're not really showing the whole story. Um, and that's one of the shortcomings of something like Seaborn is that it does a really good job um, 
with what it does, but it's not a statistical library. So there are like limitations there. Um, and there are, I know that I'm not super familiar with plotting functions in R, but I know that there are ways that you can kind of portion out uh, relationships with the different sorts of plotting libraries. Um, and another option is if you have a multivariate relationship that you're trying to show, um, you can always get fancy with your stats and plot the relationship after regressing out other variables. So you're plotting instead of y versus x, you're plotting with residuals, um, the residuals of y versus x1, for example, after regressing out x2 and x3. Um, so I think that that requires you to rely a little bit more on your statistical approach than on the plotting functions themselves. But it's a really good thing to keep in mind um, when you're when you're approaching these sorts of data visualization adventures. Thank you. Um, so we have two questions left, and I think one of them might take a little bit more time. So I'll, I'll jump to the first one of those. Um, so the ReproPub notion of research object seems to build on and relate to what was talked about previously in the course in semantic markup with um, an IDM. Do we need to use an IDM to conform with the ReproPub standard? I'll give you I'll give you my response to that, and then other folks can follow up on it. My initial answer is not necessarily no. I mean, I think Rebernim's philosophy in general is is here's the principle and IDM is a tool for being able to describe things. Describing things is very important. So the principle is the thing that's not really so negotiable, but the tool that you use to do that, you, you may come up with a different way to do it that works for you. So that's, that's my initial response to that. And I will let someone else respond further. That's pretty much what I would say. IDM is a tool for marking up certain things. It's good for, you know, Again, sharing the nifty is fine, but sharing bids is better and sharing semantic bids, you know, your bids with the you know, semantically marked up uh, you know, information is even better. Not that, uh, or if there's other ways to disambiguate, you know, the behavioral or other stuff tra trailing along with your, your imaging data. NIDM is a tool for doing that. If there's other ways to do that, that's great. And so again, so where NIDM fits in, great, use it. And other things, you know, if it's not necessary or it doesn't cover that, then it's not required. It's just one of the tools. Thank you. Um, so the last question. Um, so it says broad and somewhat philosophical question here. In the field of say physics or chemistry, I don't believe reproducibility has historically been as much of an issue as it has been in neuroimaging or other fields that involve data acquisition from human subjects. How much of the reproducibility crisis that we've been talking about do you think is influenced by it simply being too hard to reproduce findings that involve human data? In human data? Uh, e.g. measuring qualities about people's lives, experiences, and mental processes as compared to measuring electrons or whatnot. And so I guess, Julie, you touched on this a little bit previously with like yeah. the primate. Yeah, right? so, right. So from my point of view, yeah, I can't, I can't speak to the electrons. Someone else in the group can definitely speak to that. Um, but yeah, obviously, from my experience, I mean, obviously, non human primates not so far from human in, in that you may have a small sample. Um, and brains vary every, you know, every, you can look at 10 brains and if you start looking at their structure or look at the, you know, they, they vary with, um, but each of them will vary. So that issue prevails, but I, I don't think it's a new issue. It's certainly not a new issue in my experimental experience and that predates imaging and working in humans both. Thank you. I was going to say there are four physicists on this call. We should ask the four physicists mm -hmm. Uh, to what extent that physics is devoid of this problem. My general understanding is that the problem of reproducibility perfect, is pervasive to almost every field. Uh, so, yeah, um, yeah so as, as a physicist, let me jump in and say that, that yeah, I mean, my, my initial responses to the question is that um, physics is not immune to the reproducibility crisis. It's, it's just that they sort of have a, a fundamentally different framework for what their research entails. And, and so an example is how many decades have physicists been looking for the, the Higgs boson, right? And, and, and so there's, there's just a different sort of composition for what research looks like. Yes, um, physicists have very large scale, multi-site collaborative projects. Um, and, and within those projects, there is a lot of discussion um, 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 for, for how to ensure that res results are reliable, the equipment is calibrated, um, the level of testing that goes on to do that. But 
what I think is one of the primary differences is that um, in biomedical research, and for example, here neuroimaging, we are dealing with um, assessing <sighs> effects among human participants um, where there is an inherent framework of hypothesis testing. And so, you know, when I, I, I mentor quite a few uh, students who are trained as psychologists, and when they hear that I never took a stats course as an undergrad or a grad student, it's like, what? Um, and, and that's just because that's not how physics research is, is framed. And it's not about assessing whether or not an effect exists in a, among a group of samples. It's, it's more of a binary thing. Um, so I, I, I think it is different, but also um, if you dig into the physics community, yeah, there, there are certainly um, analogous issues and discussions that relate to reproducibility. It, it, it's just, it's a bit different. Yeah, as a, as a physicist too, I totally agree with everything that you just said, Angie. And um, I, I feel like, um, yeah, it's a, different, it's a different problem. The reproducibility um, issue certainly exists in physics and chemistry and in all fields. I think from my experience, um, working in physics labs and also working, you know, in neuroimaging and with like uh, education research too, um, that is very human centric. Um, it is a different kind of beast to tackle the data that you work with. And um, part of the thing that makes it complicated to, um, and, and fun to, to do that kind of science is to find out what, you know, the, the answer to your question is in these different, um, different modes of, of, uh, uh, data that you're collecting in. And uh, I think that the, I guess, reproducibility crisis that we've been talking about in this class um, is, is strongly influenced by um, uh, some of the practices. Well, some of the, the, um, the difficulty in, in um, making sure that we share what we've been doing in such a computationally heavy field um, and working with human subjects and, and the kind of complications of data in there. So yeah, but it's certainly also a problem in physics too. It's just a different kind of problem. Thank you. I guess we only have one minute left, so I guess we can wrap up, but that was, yeah, an excellent question. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for submitting such excellent questions. Thank you to Katie and Julie for joining us today. And with that, we will sign off and see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.